Okay, wonderful. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. I'm going to get started. And as people are still joining, we have over 100 participants, which is so exciting for us. Um, I wanted to welcome everyone. Um, thank you so much for joining us. Um, I think everyone should be muted upon entry. If you are not, please mute yourself. Um, unless you are one of the presenters, of course. I'm Karen Herner, and I, along with Debbie Fabian, um, would like to welcome you. We are the um, interim leadership of the Chatham Historical Society, which is the Historical Society of the Borough. Um, this, we're so pleased to be able to present this program, our annual joint program with the Chatham Township Historical Society. And before I introduce um, our first presenter, I want to, um, I would like to acknowledge Lynn McGrain, who is our program chair and thank her for helping us put this all together. Um, thank you, Lynn, for your, for your hard work. Um, we're going to have a few presenters today. I will introduce them as they are about to speak. I would ask everyone to stay muted through the program. We will take questions. If you have questions, we're gonna hold them till the end. Um, and I do encourage you, if you have a question, to type it in the chat function, um, and we'll address those at the end of all of the speakers. So welcome, welcome. Um, let's see, I want to introduce the first presenter, who is Susan Allen. Susan Allen is a past president of the Chatham Historical Society, and she is our, our current curator, and she's going to give us a little background. So Susan, go ahead. Okay. I need to share my screen. Oh, okay. Um, the Chatham Historical Society was contacted this past summer by Emily, a student from Drew University's archeology span department. She was seeking information about mills on the Passaic River. She was particularly interested in the Stanley Mill, which was owned by George Shepard Page. These photos are sitting in Stanley Park, looking north and then across to uh, Summit. The, digi the digital archeology span class had explored the shoreline and had discovered various artifacts on the river's edge. She was particularly interested in, oh, what'd I do? Whoop, whoop. She was particularly interested in the Stanley paper mill. So I went through our archives and I did locate some pictures and this one is especially interesting because it's even labeled um, 1884. For me, the starting point for anything related to Chatham is the Fishwack papers. Incidentally, these are available on the website at the Library of the Chathams. I found in the Fishwack papers an extensive article written by Mrs. C. William Morgan in which she traces the history of commerce created by the mills. She quotes an unknown contemporary historian who says, Chatham, its destiny is to be a manufacturing village with outlying suburbs in the hills. That was, in, that was a quote from 1874. But as early as 1737, there was a mill that was built on the Passaic River. By 1806, Chatham Township, as it was known then, had a population of 2,138. Today, the borough and townships combined population is approximately 19,000. So we have done some growing. There were mills at four different points on the Passaic River producing flour and paper. There was even a mill that functioned as a sawmill and a cider mill, the latter of which produced whiskey that was actually sold in Chatham. Many of the photos in the Chatham Historical Society archives are found like this. They are mounted on a cardboard-like material. And in most cases, I believe that these photos would have been destroyed without this backing. But in some instances, the cardboard is falling apart and now the, and some of the images are beginning to suffer. Um, some of the other photos that we have are labeled um, the raceway, Stanley Raceway. This picture uh, is, it's labeled Dam and Raceway, Stanley, New Jersey, 1870. And it's presented by Dr. B. Page, so it's a descendant of um, George. Just to give you an idea, um, are, are these pictures covering my picture? No. Um, the, I didn't know what a race was, but I did some homework and it says that um, a mills race is the water channel that carries water from the source 
which was the Passaic River, and directs and diverts that water to the water wheel. The Stanley Mill actually used water and steam. These are more pictures of the Stanley races, which are absolutely amazing photos, thinking that they go back to the early to late, late 1800s, early 1900s. This is a photo, two photos of the same area, but a little bit different view. But this gentleman right here, in another photo that we have, there's a man standing by uh, the by the Sunday school that he started, and it looks just like that. And he, in that picture, he is labeled George Shepherd Page. So I kind of think that might be him too. Oh, sorry. Um, this is a map from 1868. And I thought it, it's interesting because it helps give you some perspective on what, where we are. This is, um, Actually, I blew this up. This They actually say Stanley Felt Mill and the Page Depot. And there is a little road that crosses the river there. And this is the train, uh, train tracks that goes into Chatham from Summit. Today, the river is a little bit, has a little bit different route, but basically the same. And if you wanna go over to the Stanley Park, you take the river road and you get to Stanley Park and you park your car and you get out your sandwich and your Coke and you can sit there and want, look at the river and it's absolutely a beautiful spot. This is one of the best photos I think we have. And this was taken by George McDougall. He um, has a, he left us with a wonderful archive of multiple, well, tons of glass negatives and this is interesting because this is standing on the north side of the bridge and you are looking through the bridge, looking south at the mill, which is right here. And there it is all blown up. This is Fairmont Avenue up here, which used to be called Long Hill. And this was the uh, Martin Estate, which is no longer there, but it is it was on the highest point of Fairmont Avenue. So the next time you drive down Fairmont Avenue and you're at the highest point, that's where the that's where it was. Well, once questions went beyond the mill and the products manufactured and Mr. Page himself, I directed Emily to the Historical Society of Chatham Township. In addition, I gave her the email of a descendant of George Shepherd Page to question further. Your knowledge is about to be increased greatly and enriched by understanding how industrialization impacted the lives of the workers and the Chatham we reside in. The Drew archaeology students will share their experience and their discovery of the artifacts and the knowledge they obtained. Trust me, you will not be able to drive over the Passaic River, gaze at it on your train ride home from New York City, or drive on River Road without having a better insight into the past that brought us to the present. The end. <laughs> Thank you, Susan. <laughs> Okay, well now I'd like to introduce our next presenters who are um, beginning with Dr. Maria Mazzucci. Um, Dr. Mazzucci is the Associate Dean for Faculty in Arts and Sciences and Professor of Anthropology and Archeology span at Drew University. And with her, she has two students, Ava Valentino, who is a senior with a double major, if I'm correct, in Anthropology and Italian, minoring in Music and Museum Studies, which uh, that's a lot, Ava. Um, and Amy, who is also a senior at Drew University, an art history major um, with minors in um, museum studies and archaeology. So um, let's hear from, from our friends from Drew University, please. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us. I'm very pleased to be here and to be able to present these results. Uh, to you and particularly to allow my students to be able to show all that, that they've been working on over the last couple years. Uh, so I will give you a little bit of a background of how we ended up uh, you know, participating and being part of this project and having the opportunity and the privilege to begin to unravel um, the history of Chatham and Chatham Township. Let's see, I don't know, it's not advancing. 
usually don't have trouble with the, just a second, sorry. Doesn't seem to be, there we go. So uh, a number of years ago, I, uh, I have my son was small, and we used to go to Stanley Park, and um, on the also on the summit side, what the, the the modern day summit side, and some of the local uh, inhabitants of the area who were walking dogs mentioned to me, um, as my son was finding little things, being an archaeologist's son, he always tended to look down at the ground a lot. And they said, oh yeah, we find bottles, we find all kinds of things. And I noticed that there was actually a lot of artifactual material um, eroding right into the river. And every time a spring and the floods, or at least you know the water increasing, more and more of these artifacts, I would watch them run down the river. I uh, looked up the area in terms of local history as well as the, as the state archives. And it was marked as a historic mill site, as a set of a site of various mills. Um, but was marked as no historical significance because the sites had been heavily impacted so that there was no not seen to be any historic real um, you know possibility of having it declared you know preservation or uh, for state preservation so um, feeling that this was still you know really valuable set of data um, I was I took some students for our archaeology courses, and we just would recover some of the artifacts which were um, going to be carried away by the river. This then this collection then uh, was being analyzed by the students, and this current year with the challenges of the pandemic gave us the opportunity to really begin to say, how could we make these artifacts available to the public, make them part um, and available to the hist for the history of, of Chatham. And especially, how do you work online to make um, artifactual archaeological historic information available to the public? And so that is what I hope that you will see, that this is now an opportunity. This year has given us the opportunity to be able to make this information available to the public. And therefore, then we are able to communicate and gain information from the, a lot of the you know, local inhabitants who probably have a lot of background information, which would be very useful to enhance and expand this, this project. Uh, so uh, just to reiterate where we are. So um, Susan was talking about the mill area that's on this, this side um, over here on the River Road side where current day Stanley Park. Where we're finding artifacts is actually on the other side um, of the river. So if you look, I've just sort of superimposed some of these older maps on here. And it's very clear that the mills were on that, what is the current day Chatham side where Stanley Park is. That's where the mills, this one set of mills were, um, was definitely on that side. But where we're finding artifactual material is actually on the other side of the river. Um, and it's also interesting to see that there's an, uh, another older map called the Sanborn maps. Those are very famous. The 1921 map shows here again the river. This is Stanley Avenue and that bridge going across the river. And there is a domestic structure listed for right there. And that turns out to be one of the areas also that we're finding a lot of artifacts. So what are the main areas and what, um, just to give you a little bit background. So um, is that we have, um, let that person in. So if you see here, once again, the mills on that far side and then the river, here's the railroad. And when you come underneath the railroad, you come around here. And these are the two main areas of artifacts that we're finding is that one is to the east, is over in this wooded area and then on the west. And what is very interesting for the archaeologist is, is that we find that these are very distinct types of artifacts being found on these two sides. So those, of course, are those questions that we want to ask is what do these materials represent? How, what can they tell us? Uh, you know, it's important to understand the origin of them so then we know that we're accurately discussing what they could mean. So on this western side is a very interesting set of artifacts which seem to directly relate to the mill activities, particularly piles of felt. Um, that's still preserved. It has to be over a hundred years old. Far sand covered felt tiles. And that was one of the things 
as, um, as the page mills changed with the times to make other types of products. One of the final ones was to actually make roof tiles. And there are the remains of those um, of that manufacturing. And it looks so very different than the asphalt tiles that you would put on your roof today, very rough looking. But there's um, remnants of those. Also, um, a very interesting set of clothing pieces, overall buckles. And then for some strange reason, and we can't really explain, is there's porcelain doll fragments. On the other side is all what we would call archaeologically domestic household trash. So everything that you would think of that you would have in a household, everything from, sil from silverware to bottles, jars, dishware fragments, everything you would need in a, in a household, but very different from what's on the other side. So that's really the context of the artifact um, that, um, that the students now um, will talk about. Okay, and I will. Stop share again and let the students um, I'm going to allow Amy to take to go ahead and um, and take over. Let me just share the screen for Amy. Okay, Amy, do you want to go ahead and take over? Yes. So um, before we start, we thought it would be important to define the term archaeology in order to understand the purpose and methods of our project. So archaeology can be defined as the systematic study of our human past using survival material remains in order to explain the processes that influence patterns of past human behavior. It also provides insight into the life ways of past peoples and cultures, which can help us better and understand our lives today and in the future. And in doing so, it can inform us of the larger patterns of change over time in human societies. And now with the proliferation of digital platforms, it is inevitable that a new field of archeology span has arisen and it is known as digital archeology. span and this can be defined as the application of digital technologies to assist and improve traditional archaeological practices in collecting data, analyzing, interpreting, and representing the archaeological record. And some examples include GPR, ground penetrating radar, geographic information systems, and DAMS, or digital asset management systems. And that will be the focus of our presentation. Ava, do you want to try to, or Amy, do you want to try to, if for some reason it keeps um, sticking in terms of me advancing the, sc the screen. So why don't you go ahead and just um, run it yourselves? Mm -hmm. Okay. So um, just to go over the research focus and um, some of the digital product um, project resources that we used. So um, our focus was looking at the industrialization in Chatham Township at the turn of the 19th century. And some of the key points that we are looking at is accessibility of consumer products, looking at some marketing techniques and the history of marketing and consumerism trends. And in our website that we made, we are in the process of curating three main exhibits, and those focus on fashion, diet, domestic life, and health, and marketing. And the tools that we use to put this all together were Omeka and WordPress. And um, really quick, I can just show you what our Omeka site ended up looking at. Uh, Okay. 
So our Omeka site is housed on the Drew Special Collections Omeka, so we are grateful for them to allow us to use this. And just a little bit about the navigation. So we have an introduction that just talks about the context and some background information, a lot of what Professor Masucci already um, spoke about. And then like what I went over before is defining archaeology and digital archaeology. And some of the maps are here as well that Professor discussed. And um, you can see on the side that we broke it down into our exhibits, what's for dinner, what to wear, what's for sale, what's up doc. And we also have our conclusion and interpretation section and our acknowledgements. So um, I'll just click on one of the tabs to show you what an exhibit looks like. So for the what's for dinner tab, it features a cheese jar, mason jar, and a Worcestershire stopper and a couple other packing jars. And you can see here that we not only discussed the objects, but we tied it back into how marketing and consumerism played a role by including different advertisements, showing and advertising the products that we discuss. And what's really nice about this site is anyone is free to access it, most long as you have a computer and some internet. And it can be found, like I said, on the Drew Omeka site. So it can be accessible from anywhere and by anyone. So going back to our presentation, I'll let Ava start and she can discuss our first exhibit that we made and that focuses on what's for dinner, diet and domestic life. Thanks, Amy. Yep, so now we will talk about um, a little bit of our collection and feature some of the key finds that we discovered uh, recently over the past few months, but also um, in the years that this project has kind of been ongoing. So as Amy kind of mentioned, we have about three or four exhibits and today we'll be talking about um, three of them. The first called What's for Dinner, featuring objects that showcase uh, diet and domestic life of early Chatham. So our first um, artifact, as Amy showed you all in the Omeka site, um, it's, in, it's an artifact that is the base of a McLaren's Imperial cheese jar, which we have included in some pictures uh, for reference. And this is one of the many foreign food imports that we learned of while researching um, the finds from the fall and also just the finds in general for the scope of the project. So McLaren's was first produced and manufactured in Canada in 1892 and the company was founded in 1891 by the McLaren brothers. This was a high-end cheese spread and it gained global popularity as it was considered to be actually one of the first soft processed cheeses to be commercially distributed. The company had several branch factories as well across the world including Mexico, London, New York, Japan, and even Africa. So this was really exciting to find. And I think Amy will discuss the next artifact. Yes, so the next one that we have is the Lee and Perrin's Worcestershire bottle and stop, stopper. And it was a staple condiment during the gold rush. So it was created in 1938 by John Duncan Sons in Britain. And it was originally um, just a product in Britain, but it was later sold in the United States and became really popular in Mississippi Mississippi and other Midwestern states during the gold rush. And we also begin to see it being carried by restaurants, hotel dining rooms, and dining salons on British ships coming to the United States. So with a lot of this product being shifted to the American market, finally in 1876, we see these bottles are now produced in the United States and due to their popularity. And um, something that we see a shift when it does come to the United States is the cork stoppers that were placed in the bottles. So before 1957, they had glass cork stops, which look like the one that my mouse is pointing to. And it's the one that we have in our collection. But after 1957, it was made using actual cork as pictured right here. And this is what the bottles look like today. They are still producing and they are still um, quite popular in both the United States and America. Okay, 
Um, I asked the students if I would be able to um, to discuss this uh, these artifacts. This is probably one of the ones I found most fascinating um, because of the kind of history that it takes you through after finding one little single um, artifact. One of the um, most common actually milk glass uh, pieces that we find are from different sizes of um, of armor and company packing jars. They come in different sizes and the different sizes and different types would hold different types of products. So this is, these were all uh, originated from Chicago in the Armor and Company, which was founded in 1867 by Philip Armour. Uh, probably a name that would be familiar to many of you, but when you look into the history, uh, probably most of you would not be surprised to know how central and important meat packing was to Chicago. And it was at some at one point early um, in the mid to late 19th century, one of, uh, almost one of the, lar the, the largest single factory employers in the entire country. There were so many different uh, phases and sides to the um, uh, to their manufacturing industry and employed a vast number of people. What was really interesting is they began to heavily market to women and housewives. And that was because as there was a uh, household income was actually handed to women in the late 19th century, and they were responsible for purchasing, purchasing and making the, the choice of what products to, to purchase for the kitchen. They produced cookbooks on how to use their product and their, their product, which they really heavily marketed was their beef extract, which is basically a type of you know, meat gelatin that was put into the jar and was then spread, used for, to make soups, kind of the precursor to bouillon cubes. Um, their catchphrase was that they used everything but the squeal. The problem is, can you go ahead and advance, Amy, to the next? Is that uh, Armour and Company found itself a little bit in, in, a, in a bad situation in the early part of the 20th century, as um, many of you may, may, may know that there was a uh, discovery of the types of conditions that were taking place in these factories. And Uptown Sinclair, be, uh, famous for his, um, for his book, revealing these conditions called The Jungle. Now, um, it was published in 1906. His main goal had been to, to expose the poor working conditions of the factory workers. But what the public really keyed in on was what was actually going into these products. And so unfortunately, he was always disappointed in the outcome of his work in that he was, was really wanted to help the workers. But what people were concerned about was more about what they were eating and what was actually in these containers that they thought were so good for them. They then started a counter campaign and, and started to, you know, trying to convince the public that their products were safe and the clean. And their new motto, rather than everything but the squeal, was was contained the best and only beef. So they were trying to, to counter the, um, the, the perception of that there was, you know, other things and waste, rat droppings and waste materials going into their products. So another um, interesting find were these fragments and entire beer bottles, which we later learned were from local New Jersey breweries and bottle makers. So I put here um, a couple of their advertisements and as well as their names and locations. So you may actually be able to recognize a few. There are some that are still present today. I believe the Ballantine Brewery is one of them. Uh, we also found uh, bottles from the Brandt Brother Brothers Bottlers, say that three times fast, um, from Newark, New Jersey as well as Kruger's Brewing Company as well in Newark as well, and then the Rising Sun Brewing, Brewing Company, Company in Elizabeth, uh, New Jersey. And um, in our next slide, we feature a couple pictures from these bottles. So these were really interesting because I believe out of all of them, just the one on the left, the Brandt Bro Bo Brothers, oh my goodness, sorry, the Brandt Brothers Bottlers, features their, um, their name as well as their location in Newark, which it's a little hard to tell in the picture, uh, but it is 287 Washington Street, Newark, New Jersey. And, the, and this company was really well known for their soda and mineral uh, water bottles at the time. So that was really fun to, to find this, this intact bottle. The other three bottles feature uh, really intricate maker's mark designs as well as their names and then the location 
on the bottle and of their company as well. So as you can see in the Rising Sun Brewing Company, it says a little Elizabeth, New Jersey um, on the bottom with the maker's mark in the center with the R and like the S kind of intertwining with each other. Um, as well as Ballantine Brewery, you kind of see the name um, in a circular motion going around there. And then the Kruger's Brewing Company um, on the bottom, oh, again, a little hard to tell, but it says Newark, New Jersey, um, as well as their, their name on the top. So what was um, really interesting about this was that this started to show the interaction and exchange of goods between neighboring towns and even a preference for local American beer, whereas some of the other popular food items were imported, such as the McLaren's cheese and the Worcestershire sauce from uh, Britain. So with these observations in diet and domestic life um, in this exhibit, we begin to recognize like the food habits and the tastes of early Chatham residents and just the role that marketing and globalization played in early Chatham domestic life, which was um, really exciting to uncover in the process of this all. And I believe our next slide features the next exhibit, What's Up Doc? And I'll let Amy um, take it away. Sorry about that. So in What's Up Doc, this is where we explore health in the late 19th and early 20th centuries. And the first thing that I will explore is the John Wyeth and Brothers um, company. And they were created in 1961 by John and Frank Wyeth, who formed a partnership and created an apothecary store in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. And they were known for drug manufacturing, and their business was driven by the need for um, drug-related supplies after a shortage during the Civil War. And their business was extremely successful and they did have to expand a few times and eventually they went to New York. We see them come to um, Madison, New Jersey, and we even see them go to a few other towns as well. So what they were most well known for was their sweet elixirs. They helped pioneer the pill and tablet form of medicine. And they also contributed to the manufacture of the polio and smallpox vaccines. And in this case, the, what, they what we have from their company is a blue bottle that is in a rectangular shape. And although we don't have any labels confirming this, we were able to find a few images on the internet as seen on the right that says sodium phosphate. So based on the color and the shape, we were able to guess that this was the same bottle pictured. And it states that what was in this bottle was a mild and pleasant, pleasant laxative employed in the treatment of constipation, obesity, children's diarrhea, rickets, jaundice, etc. So we see that it has many functions as well. And in the 1930s, this product was, or this company was sold to American Home Products, and their base was actually in Madison, New Jersey, right next to Drew University. So like Ava said before, we are seeing this preference for local medicines, and we are seeing um, medicines that started in other countries in the United States start to come to New Jersey and start to come to the local town. And um, just a little interesting fact is also in 2009, the company was subsidized by Pfizer. So we do see it was really successful. It continues today and it was bought out by a large pharmaceutical company. Um, the next object that I will talk about is Phillips Milk of Magnesia. And it was created in 1972 by Charles Henry Phillips. And it was used to help with um, stomach acid and as a laxative. And we can see here on the left-hand side, it was first advertised as an astringent and as a deodorant. And like the John Wyeth bottle that I showed you before, this company still continues today. And this is what the bottle looks like. And it's still used as a lax laxative as well. And finally, we have Bowick and Taffel, New York. And it was created by F.E. Bowick and A.G. Taffel as a partnership in New York in 1869. 
And during the 1949 Korea pandemic, um, Korea was rapidly spreading across Europe and the United States. And during this time, it was actually found that homeopathic medicines were more effective than traditional medicines. And as a result, a lot of physicians at the time took up this product, um, including Boic and Tafel. So in 1853, they began to manufacture homeopathic medicines and they turned into a pharmaceutical giant of the time. And a variety of compounds could be stored in this bottle that we have pictured to your left, and it would have originally been labeled with a paper sticker as seen on the right, this image we found on the internet, and um, it would have told you what was contained in the bottle, so unfortunately, we don't know exactly what this bottle stored, but we do know it was involved in this rise of the homeopathic medicine era, and they were often sold as kits, as you can see here, that contained other medicines. All right, so the next exhibit is what to wear, and Ava's going to talk about this one. So for our final exhibit, this is going to um, highlight a couple of key artifacts that were found to showcase the fashion and style in early Chatham. And so beginning with this sort of idea of the feminine figure, our finds included well over 20 pieces of these very small metal corset slots um, or pegs, if you want to call them, from the split busk design, design that was invented in 1829. And this is pictured in the bottom left-hand corner. Um, it was invented, like I said, in 1829 by the French uh, corsetier Jean-Julien Jocelyn. And this was really magnificent because this eased the intense process of what you can imagine lacing was because it featured instead now a front facing slot and stud closure to remove the corset. So this way you didn't have to have anybody unlacing it for you and go kind of through that hassle. So um, it was much more accessible for women to take off their corsets. This became extremely popular after Joseph Cooper patented a design in 1848 in America which as you can see on the right, I was able to find um, an example from the Metropolitan Museum of Art, the Crotty and, Crotty and Richards corset with the split busk um, feature. So you can see there are those two panel, metal panels kind of embedded in the corset with the, with the slots kind of sticking out a bit and it would close um, almost like a keyhole kind of idea. Um, so as we can see from this example, the corsets in 19th century helped women achieve what was considered to be that ideal hourglass and small waist feminine figure from wearing such heavily bone corsetry um, and of course the tight lacing that was involved. We also found a couple different pieces pictured in the center um, of ring pieces that were uh, considered corset like grommets and eyelets and just the overall condition of these pieces. They're um, pretty intact, but of course heavily rusted and some have even deterior deteriorated. Um, so in the next slide, I'll talk about uh, men's fashion and style. And um, as Professor mentioned earlier, we began to find a very large concentration of suspender pieces. Um, so just a very brief little um, background about that, suspenders or braces as called in, in Britain were a very inter, inter, integral, sorry, style piece in men's fashion during the 18th, 19th, and even early, early 20th century. They were very decorative accessories and they served, of course, an essential purpose of holding up your undergarments and high-waisted pants. The British designer Albert Thurston created suspenders that attach via leather loops and these are still uh, manufactured today. The suspender pieces featured in this collection include a really wide mix and variety of buckles and adjuster pieces, and along with some other ident unidentifiable but definitely related metal pieces that maybe could have belonged to other areas on the suspender strap or even the garter belt. And we have a couple of those examples um, listed in this slide here. And then in the following slide, we just have a broader view of the other suspender pieces that were found, which were much more um, decorative. So you could see here there's one even with like birds looking like they're on top of a fountain, um, different kinds of styles that all had different functions. Um, 
So this is just to give an estimate as to how many types of suspenders we were able to find that were um, left behind. And then if you see in the top left-hand corner, there was another common type of suspender, suspender piece found made by C.H. Guyot, which was um, according to their marketing and advertising campaigns, was the highest quality and most highly recognizable um, suspender piece. So that was uh, really interesting. And in our next slide, just a little bit more about um, C.H. Guyot. We were able to find a couple um, extra pictures showcasing like the advertisement. Um, we even found a picture that um, resembles the, um, the suspenders worn by President Roosevelt. And this advertisement that also um, talks about how the social, pre the social pressure of men having to kind of wear these uh, suspender pieces, saying that anyone who does not wear these uh, Guyo suspenders are uh, hygienically every man commits a crime against common sense if he does not wear Guyo suspenders. So that was pretty, pretty interesting. And we're, we're seeing such a, such a specific idea of what the fashion sense was um, back in the day. So just to kind of wind down and just summarize some of um, our main conclusions that we found was by the late 19th century, inhabitants of historic Chatham Township nestled along the Passaic River, and they had access to both local and international products. And some of the more um, local products were from Newark, New York, and Philadelphia. And some of the more distant manufacturers were from Chicago, Canada, and a few countries throughout Europe. And some of the broader themes that we were able to come up with were industrialization, the history of marketing and advertising, and globalization did not just begin in the 20th century, it was going on for nearly a few decades beforehand. And there are three main points that we learned. And the first was that the place and participation of Chatham, New Jersey in changing and dynamic histories um, of industrialization and early globalization from the mid 1800s to the early 1900s. So even though most of the products that we discussed were not produced in Chatham themselves or Madison or even Florham Park. A lot of these international and other local um, made products at least pass through Chatham. So we see Chatham partake in this global dialogue and this global exchange. We also see the power of oral interviews in history to give context to material remains. So we would like to thank um, Sarah Stanley for the interview that we were able to have with her. And this is where oral histories are extremely important because a lot of the information that we learned from her, we could not find in any history textbooks and it was a little limited on the website. So it is always nice to get that more personal experience as well. And finally, we learned the use and usefulness of digital tools and databases and digital information for specialized research of artifacts. And by using Omeka and WordPress, we were able to use these interactive applications as a way to present archaeology on a more public and larger scale. And with this data now in a digital format, the information was made more easily accessible and more broadly employed for educational purposes such as today. And what we found surprising was that the number of surface artifacts that were laying in just plain sight and um, anywhere you went in the park, you could maybe find a chip of a teacup or a piece of a bottle shard, something that like professor said can be easily overlooked. And um, what we really learned is how much history they can reveal and what all these objects told us about Chatham and their role in the global dialogue. And finally, we were surprised by the limitation of historical records, which focus on history and the factory owners and the power of material remains to help us learn about the everyday lives of the inhabitants of Chatham. Because a lot of this information that we found was not initially written down in diaries or textbooks. A lot of what we used is material culture to learn about the everyday lives of Chatham. 
inhabiting. Me, excuse me, can and, you show, um, do you remember the map that we had? The um, Could you show the map, remember the global map? As the ending, the, as the ending piece. Oh, the um, Google Maps. Yes, that, that um, I think that to end with would be really would be really nice to um, to show. Mm -hmm. um, I'll pull it up. Um, I know we have our acknowledgement slide, but I'll pull it up because it's on a separate um, okay. slideshow. But I'll pull it up as soon as um, we're done. Okay. So finally, before we get to that. Um, really interesting map. Uh, we just wanted to acknowledge the assistance, participation, and interest provided to our project over the past couple of months um, in trying to get this, uh, in trying to really kickstart this project again. It was a privilege to work with the Chatham Historical Society and Chatham Township Historical Society on this collaborative project, and we really hope to work closely with them in the future. So thank you, Susan Allen, Pam Wells, and Martha Wells, Sarah Stanley, and Don Davidson, the Drew University Digital Humanities Program and the Digital Humanities Funding through the support of the Mellon Foundation, as well as Danielle Ray and Katie Caljean. And lastly, we would just like to welcome anyone who has any information or any additional information, I should say, about Chatham family histories or additional info about the mill sites to please reach out to us so we can begin to really just uncover more about this, um, about this time in uh, Chatham's history. Um, and I'll bring it back to Amy to show you guys the um, map that was created. Mm -hmm. um, I'm just gonna stop sharing real quick and I'll pull it up on my screen. Did it come up, Amy? So I can share mine. Did you get yes. it? Um, yeah. Um, let's see. There you go. I just oh, so I so impressive. I wanted you to show everyone. I thought it was really. It definitely is. So what this map shows, and I can zoom in a little after I explain it, is the objects that we have in our Omeka site right now, roughly about 50 we made a geolocation map of where all of the objects came from. So we can see that a lot were manufactured in the United States, but we also have some manufactured in Europe and Asia as well. So um, just to start out, this is, let me zoom in. Let's see. So all of the blue points, or where some of the artifacts were um, manufactured. And right now what I have highlighted is where the Passaic River East Zone is located. But um, a couple other artifacts that we have were, um, you can go to Newark. And you can click on the one and you can show, it shows the artifact right mm -hmm. there, Amy. Yeah, so from Newark, we see the Valentine Brewery and the Kruger Brewery. So, um, we can go to Germany and see that those are where the frozen Charlotte dolls are, the um, ceramic dolls. And we can go to Detroit, for example. So um, I think you guys get the idea and you can see that these are where the towns that they came from and it really helps all of our artifacts. It helps us put our artifacts in a global context to see really how Chatham was participating in this industrial boom and this global trade. Thank you, Amy. And I just want to end with, um, with thanking the other students that participated this year, which is Emily Graves, um, Aisha Rain, and Juliet Levin. Um, and there's been some other students over the years, but this year they really gave the, this superhuman effort um, during COVID to help us work all online developing this project. So thank you, everyone. Um,
for listening and we really do welcome any information that you have or any artifacts if anyone has found anything from these sites we'd be happy to have a picture and um, add it to our Omeka site. Thanks very much. Thank you so much, um, ladies, um, but we're not finished yet. We still have Pat Wells from the Township Historical Society who is going to, um, is going to speak to us. Pat? I hope we have Pat, there she is. Just hold it down. I'm here, just let me get to the uh, right one. Sorry. Okay, I'm going to take you back in time just a little bit. And um, almost all of the uh, mills that were uh, along the Passaic River, oops along the Passaic River originally were built by the Bonnell family. And if you've driven down uh, Wachung Shung Pike Avenue towards Summit anytime lately, you've seen that uh, there's a historic marker put up going over the bridge that actually describes Bonnell Town. And it was called Bonnell Town because everybody there was a Bonnell and everybody there had a mill. So the original Bonnell Mills were right where 24 crosses the river where Day's Bridge originally was. And it was uh, Nathaniel Bonnell number three who originally purchased that and with his sons built a mill at the foot of where Summit Avenue in Chatham crosses over the Passaic. There was another mill at the bottom of Wachung and then there was the mill that we've mostly been talking about that was at where Stanley Park is now. Now, this family really knew how to run the businesses. They did very well. The um, Nathaniel Bonnell Three's three sons, Benjamin, Captain Nathaniel, and John. John had, actually was a blacksmith. They ran mills and supplied the revolutionary war materials for the Continental Army. And all three of those men actually were in the Continental Army at some time. And I want you to just look at their birth dates and do some quick math to realize how old Nathaniel and Benjamin were when they joined the Continental Army in 1776. Benjamin was 53 and Nathaniel was 45. And apparently this wasn't that common. Now I'm gonna jump down to Nathaniel five. He actually ran the mill at Stanley Park, what is now Stanley Park for a number of years. It was a sawmill then. And he had a house just down River Road um, closer towards Southern Boulevard. and. The Chatham Historical Society was, the Chatham Township Historical Society was actually able to do an archeological dig in the 1960s when that land was sold to Baker Firestone to put up the condominiums that are there now. And when um, Dr. Masucci got to see a couple of the slides that we have, she was very excited because there was a, a plate there that they only had pulled up pieces, little small shards, but they hadn't been able to see enough of the plate to see the maker's mark. So she's looking forward to seeing our plate. So Nathaniel Five had a son, Jonathan Crane Bonnell, and Jonathan got the mill when he was only 29, when his father died fairly young. And that was, um, just after the War of 1812, when Nathaniel Five was making a whole lot of uh, the beams that are needed to build ships with. So some of the materials that were being produced in Chatham Township in 1812 were being used to make ships to fight the War of 1812. So that, that's pretty cool. So Jonathan Cranebaugh now comes in 
and uh, he he's something else. He was known as Crane. And I'm going to show you on this um, 1845 John Littell map, which is one of the best maps of the period because bless his heart, he put names on everything. So here you can see this snake going along the bottom is the Passaic River. And you can see the fat bulge behind the dam. This is the, the uh, sawmill <clears throat> where Stanley Park is now. And look everywhere where it says J.C. Bonnell or J.C.B. And you can see it all over here. And then I want you to notice this sort of um, curve that's coming out and around in the lower right-hand corner. And that is the railroad. And that railroad was built in 1837. And that's a really important thing because that railroad is what got George Shepard Page here. And it also helped to a very large degree to keep the industries that were in Chatham alive in Chatham. So Jonathan Crane Bonnell owned 200 acres on Turkey Hill. And if you don't know where Turkey Hill was, that was what Summit is now. So Jonathan knew that if he could get people out of the city and onto his hilltop in the summer, he could make a load of money because back then the only air conditioning was a front porch and open windows. So he had all this land that was just farmland where Summit is now but he could only get people out of New York and Newark and Patterson if they had easy transportation and that would be a train. So Jonathan Crane Bonnell finds out that the state legislature has, has chartered the Morrison Essex Railroad in 1835 to figure out how and where they're going to build it. Jonathan gets on the board he buys a whole lot of stock and he talks the directors into the direction that he wants it to go. Now, conflict of interest was just fine back then. So let me orient you here. The red arrow is pointing to Millville. We now know it as Milburn. The blue arrow is pointing to Chatham. The most reasonable route for that railroad is to go straight down what is now Route 24. But Summit, Turkey Hill, is where the yellow arrow is. And that's where Crane wants it to go. So he convinces the directors, buys enough stock, and guarantees them that he will get that train up and over the mountain. Now, these trains were just little things back then. They didn't have a lot of power. So he was going to have teams of oxen at the base of each hill to be able to pull that engine up and over and onto Turkey Hill. They bought it, he did it, and now Summit exists. Without that, it just would have become a suburb of Springfield. So you can see there where the, where the railroad is going through. Now, <clears throat> excuse me, George Shepard Page arrived in New York City in 1862. And uh, he was a newlywed and he and his wife, Emily, quickly had two children, both of whom died as toddlers. So they decide they got to get out of town. They need a country life. So George gets on the train, the uh, Morrison Essex train, and he's looking out the windows as he goes along, looking at the towns. And he comes around out of Summit and down that hill and off to the left are these derelict mill sites. That's what he wants, that's what he needs. And George Shepard Page buys the land. So George put up his mills. There were, um, he died in 19, I'm sorry, 1890. And things kind of went downhill after that. There were a number of different businesses that tried to make a go at it. Some came, some went. One of them was the malt creamlet factory. And this made a candy that was made out of wheat 
and malt. And one of the um, oral histories that I reviewed actually came from the Chatham Historical Society from, let me get her name, from Elsie Monteith. And she remembered, uh, as several other uh, oral historians did, that they had been told that if you go and knock on a certain window at the candy factory, they would open the window and toss candy out to you as a reward. So she remembers this as a child. She also remembered rooting around in the old tar paper factory that there were still rolls of tar paper there and that there was also a tar pit that was covered with heavy timbers that was of course really dangerous for kids to play around in, but they just couldn't resist. Then um, we had another uh, oral history from <clears throat> Jared Moore, who was born in 1893. And he went to the candy factory and got candy tossed at him as well. But he also remembered how having the dam there made a wonderful swimming hole. And it also enabled the existence of Cram's holiday retreat. And this was a little ways up on the river, closer to the bridge that crosses over the Passaic River and goes into New Providence. And it was there in the late 1800s and sort of started to fade out in the 1890s. And they rented canoes that people could canoe from there down to the dam and back. There was a dance pavilion and ice cream was sold there. So the, that dam sort of um, allowed people a kind of recreation that they couldn't have if the water was um, faster than that. <clears throat> also, the um, what was often referred to as the Edwards Dam that was at the, uh, the Summit Avenue area, that was a favorite swimming hole too. And that was the last of the dams to be torn down. And the local kids were just broken hearted because after that, there was just no swimming hole left. It was no good. So um, I just wanted to share with you some of those uh, sort of more personal stories for um, people who could actually tell their story. So thank you very much, Maria. I am so impressed by what your students have done. And we got to break the news to Maria that we have all of these artifacts from the uh, archeological that dig that we did that she's gonna get to see as soon as we can start mixing more when everybody is vaccinated. So that's gonna be really cool. Thank you. Pat, thanks so much. I think now we can address some of the questions. And I, I think some people have already put some questions in the chat. So I'm going to open that up. Um, let me see. Um, let me go back and see. We, we did have, let's see what we had a question. Hmm, let me find maybe our first question uh, was. Um, oh, there was a question posed by Robert Keller. Have you considered? the Bonnell's mill site, it is down river and left undisturbed. The raceway walls are still intact. Pat, do you know what he's referring to there? Um, if he would tell me which road it's near. Robert, are you still with us? Let's see. Um, if I can find him, I can unmute him, can't I? And also, if anybody wants to speak, if you're on a, a laptop computer or a regular computer, just press the, the spacer bar and hold it down to talk, and then you can release it and you're muted again. I think I may have to allow people to unmute themselves, but I've done that now. Okay, sorry, I can talk now. So yeah, I'm looking up the crossroad right now. I'll have it for you in about two minutes, I'm sorry. Okay, well, while you do that, let's move along and see, do we have another question? Um, Hi, this, asked a question. Uh, this is Bruce Hobby. Uh, last question, 
as many people know that the Passaic River is now a trout stocked water. And I was wondering if the m multiple fishermen who are there uh, were any source of the material that they might find since they both wade on the sides of the river and they wade into the river. You, you, you're thinking about like the suspender pieces and the, and the dishes and things like that? Oh, I was I was thinking of anything that might be in the in or around the river. There's so many people there now um, fishing. They might be a source for you. Yeah. Oh. Oh. I see what you mean as a source of information and other artifacts. It, exactly. Yeah. 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 No. It, I would love to. Um, if anyone has anything, and you know, and together with the Chatham Historical Society and Chatham Township Historical Society, we'd love to add it to the, um, add it to our collection of of you know all we need is a photograph and and um, and so then we could investigate what it is. And what, as you saw, you know, we, this is typical for the, for archeologists and why I was so excited to see the complete um, plate that they had was we're always working with these little tiny fragments and spending hours, you know, trying to investigate, like, you know, we have a little bit of the maker's mark or we have just a little bit of the bottle. Uh, and, and then, then, but that's part of the fun of archeology span is then trying to, to extrapolate to the whole, to the whole artifact. But yeah, no, definitely. I go down there quite often just to sort of, <laughs> just to see if there's anybody there and ask them if they found anything. Someone had right. asked in the chat about um, coins and that was really disappointing is, is, I mean, that doesn't mean that we won't find any, but so far we have not found any coins. Um, but, um, but I did say in the chat, we, we have um, really interesting buttons um, that each button um, takes you into, there was like a John Wanamaker button from like 1880 that, Turns out that they would, you know, um, that was a very major, uh, obviously famous brand, but also Goodyear, there's rubber buttons. And that has a really fascinating history that, um, that Goodyear, you think of like this famous, you know, Goodyear, but it was this poor man who, who actually spent years and years, his whole life trying to perfect how you took rubber and actually made it, I don't know the right words, but that it would actually not melt with the sun. And he kept making products and then they would melt. Um, and he finally, finally perfected the, the whole process and made buttons. But then he never actually benefited from that actually going and being the basis for tires that we have today. But they took the name Goodyear from his work, but he actually never benefited. He mainly made button, rubber buttons. And we have, we have rubber buttons on the site, which say Goodyear Rubber Company on them. Here, this is Robert again. It's Chatham Road, uh, where it crosses the Passaic. There's a triangular piece of land that's on the southern part, southern part of the shore, and it's to east of Chatham Road. And as far as I can tell, it's been undisturbed since the mill got torn down, because when I went back in there, the uh, raceway walls are still intact, and it's just silted in. I don't know if anyone's been. It's not a big piece of land, but it's never been disturbed. Maria. Okay, I know where I'm going. Uh, and so, you know, I overlaid it with the old mill maps and I found that there was a mill there and it had never been, no one's ever built on that. It's like the last piece of property. No one's never been a bulldozer or anything. So you can see the mounds where the buildings are still back in there. Thank you. That is really great. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Oh, let's see. I see. Karen, you just muted yourself. Oh, Karen Blumenthal? I did the opposite of what I was trying to do. Um, Tom oh. asked a question, were any building foundations found for the mills and what happened to the businesses slash buildings? Does um, anyone have an answer? On, yeah, on the side um, where we've been finding the artifacts, we, have, we find bricks, we find large metal pieces, which are probably left over from you know, various elements of the various um, mills and factories, whatever that was there, but we've never um, actually found foundations, but we are working really, you know, just look surface and, um, and really um, in a lot of overgrowth. So, you know, this is back, if you go there, you'll see there's like a lot of woods. So we have never cleared anything. We've never actually, you know, cleaned off the surface. So, um, so there might definitely might be something, might be something there. There are foundations, the wall along the river on the Chatham side are the old mill foundations. Mm -hmm. yep. 
So they're very visible. Yeah. That's the one area I'm aware yeah. of right there. That's, yeah. The wall right along Stanley Park is right against the river is the old mill foundation. Okay, I didn't know if that was the, the mill foundation, but there's there's maybe three spots from both sides where you can see different places, but I, we have not investigated if those are foundations. So that's, I leave that to, yeah. Um, well, what all this brings to, what all this brings to mind is that there is so much more history that we need to dig up. And with the, the pictures from both historical societies and with those bright young kids from Drew, let's, let's get going here. We got more work to do. Karen Blumenfeld asked a question. Is the Turkey Hill Inn in Summit an original building when it was known as Turkey Hill and not yet Summit? Does anyone know that? Pat, do you know anything about that? That, that is a pretty old building. It's um, architecture says it was built at the turn of the century. So I don't think it goes back as far as uh, Crane, but it certainly goes back to the time when that area was proliferating and um, nice hotels were nice, what we would call rooming houses were, were being built so that a family could go, a proper family could go and stay there. That is an old building. Um, Andy Hollander um, asked a question about whiskey making. <laughs> Andy, was that a serious question? Is he still, do we still have Andy? Has Andy left to have some whiskey? Right. <laughs> and let's see. <laughs> Never joke about good bourbon. <laughs> um, well, it's legal in New Jersey now. We, and we have an interesting story from Doug that says, do you see that all in the chat? Can you see it? It's from at 3.12 PM back in the late 1940s. He helped his father get red bricks from the old factory that he used to build an outdoor fireplace near the back property line at 3 Fuller Avenue. A number of the bricks were piled at the back of the garage when the property was sold in 1999. There may also be bricks tossed onto the New Jersey transit property at number one Fuller. Hmm. Okay, I'm looking to see if we have any other questions. Um, while I'm doing this, does anyone have a question? You can unmute yourself and ask a question for any member of the panel if you'd like. Question from Rick Anderson. Go ahead. Uh, I've enjoyed the presentation uh, immensely. Um, uh, uh, Dr. Mazzucci, um, uh, uh, how can we uh, uh, access the Drew Omega site, please? Um, we can put it in the chat, a chat again. It should be, uh, Amy or Ava, it should, it should be available to the public. It's the um, Drew Methodist Archives is uh, an open access website. And then we, it has a whole series of different collections because the Methodist Archives has a lot. Um, and so we are one of their many exhibits. Amy, do you want to, so let's put it in the chat and then you can try to access it, make sure that you can, um, that you can get it. But if you go, if you, you could do a Google search right now and say, um, through University Methodist Archives. I think what, Amy put it in the chat at 2.57 okay. p.m. Okay. Um, the, other nice, again. the other really nice thing is Omeka. We wanted to use something that was a freeware. Um, we don't have a lot, you know, we don't have a lot of funds and we also were hoping that this could be a collaboration with Chatham. And so we wanted to, you know, make use of resources which would be available to everyone and affordable. So Omeka, the, the type of Omeka we're using, Omeka Collect, is it Omeka Collections, I think, Amy? Omeka oh, Collections. Classic. Um, Omeka Classic. Is, um, is open to the public. So Chatham, we could work with them and they could start building um, some entries in Omeka and those can actually be uploaded into the Methodist, in, into the site very easily. So this is, you know, something that, you know, we could start building this together. Um, and then all the artifact reports would be accessible to, um, to anybody. Rick, I just emailed you. Yes, yeah, thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Maria, and thank you, Robert. 
Uh, also, uh, 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 doctor, um, I'm with the New Providence Historical Society. Uh, do you, can you recommend a, a site where Sanborn maps can be uh, viewed online? Um, sure, we, we, we found everything by, uh, um, by just you know, uh, searching. So um, I, I'll, I'll put where we found them. Um, I mean, and that's one of the things that, you, that we found was um, when, why we wanted to make this publicly accessible was how many things are not digitized yet. I mean, you know, we've gone a long way, but a lot of New Jersey resources like through the New Jersey State Library and everything are still not digitized. So during COVID, we couldn't get a lot of access. Um, but I will, I'll put that in the chat. Let me just find our link to that, to the Sanborn maps. Um, so they're, they're really interesting to look at. We are recording um, the presentation and, and we'll have a link to that on the, on the Chatham uh, Borough Historical Society website. And I imagine that Pat can also in, include that link on, on the Chatham Township Historical Web Society website. Um, and we can uh, post the links to the Drew uh, websites there as well to make it uh, easily easier for people to um, to look at all this because it's really really very interesting. I do think we're running a little. Um, we've been on for a while now, so maybe we should start to to try to wrap this up. Um, if any, if no one has any other questions, let's see. Oh, someone had a comment, Joanne White said that um, John Cunningham, who of course, John Cunningham is the, the author of our, oh, I don't have the book handy, do I? I do. I'm assuming she's talking about John Cunningham, the, the author of Chatham at the Crossing of the Fishwack. Um, she said, before he died, John Cunningham told me the summit side of Stanley Park was a dump for post-colonial people and taverns, including all the oyster shells. That would make a lot of sense to what we're finding in that mm -hmm. one part. That's really fascinating because we did, we found a lot of oyster shells, which I thought were very interesting. Hmm. Um, yeah, that would make a lot of sense. So I'll try to um, I'll write that down and, and try to investigate that. Thank you, Joanne. Yeah, thank you. Um, before we wrap up, wrap up the, the thing that I wanted to, um, before we close, I wanted to encourage everyone who's here, um, thank you all. For, for joining us. We had a wonderful turnout. We were so, we're so happy with that. Um, we want to encourage you to, um, if, to follow uh, the Chatham Historical Society and the Chatham Township Historical Society on Instagram. If you're on Instagram, um, I will put our, um, I guess I was going to put it in the, in the little message in the chat here. Um, we, uh, the, uh, the chat, the, the Historical Society of the Borough, our, is, our Instagram account is um, history, let's see, history Chatham and J. Okay, Ch Chatham Township is not on Instagram, but we are on Facebook and you can find us as Chatham Township Historical Society on Facebook. Yeah, but and you're, also, aren't you on Instagram, Pat? I thought I followed you guys on Instagram. Yeah, we maybe we are. <laughs> uh, maybe we are. That I'll check with Sheila. Um, I I'll want to. I want to let everyone know that on May first, the Chatham Township Historical Society at the Red Brick Schoolhouse is part of Pathways in History for Morris County, and uh, it's Saturday, May first from noon until four, everything is outside. You do need to wear a mask and we will have uh, social distancing, but we will be highlighting the women of Chatham, the Lenape's and uh, preservation. And we would also like to invite you to our um, next uh, Zoom presentation, which will also be with the library. And that is the history of the White House and that will be on Sunday, May 30 at four o'clock. If you would like to join us for that, I think you'll enjoy it. Thanks. Wonderful, thank you so much, Pat. Okay, if no one has any other questions or anything else, I think maybe we'll, um, we will close. I wanna thank um, Dr. Mizuchi and um, Ava and Amy, her students. Um, and I will also wanna thank obviously um, Pat Wells of the Township Historical Society and um, Susan Allen of the, the Borough Historical Society. 
Um, this has been really delightful. And can we also thank Galena at the Library of the Chathams for oh my gosh, of course. being our platform. Thank you, Galena, so much. <laughs> okay, yes, anytime. And thank you to you, Lynn. And thank you to you, Karen. <laughs> bringing us this program. Thank you, thank you. Okay, enough of the well, Karen, you did a great job. <laughs> Let's go out and enjoy this beautiful day. Yep. Thank, thank you, everyone. Bye-bye. Thank you.